Rhodesia, 1971. The troops rehearse their drill for the funeral of three of their comrades, blown up by a landmine laid by black nationalists. Right, get your rifle down to the position of the wrist on your arms reverse once again. The right leg is then bent so the thigh is parallel to the ground and you resume the correct position of the present. Are there any questions? Right, watch the squad now. Look down, brace up. The three men died near Rhodesia's border with Mozambique. Nine months compulsory national service is part of the growing up of every young white male in Rhodesia. For, as the government will tell you, this is a country at war, threatened by black governments to the north, attacked by economic sanctions, coping with a fresh outbreak of militant black protest against Ian Smith's government. Ray! On a word of command, Squad 3, the rifle is rotated in an anti-clockwise direction, right hand controlling the rifle. Under the eyes of Cecil Rhodes' statue in the heart of Salisbury, there have been demonstrations by young black Rhodesians, anxious to bring their dissatisfaction to the attention of the British negotiators as they talked with Ian Smith's representatives. They marched and scores were arrested. 82 were sentenced each to six cuts of the cane. It's wishful thinking for Heath to expect Smith to reason. The only way for Smith to reason is to use violence. That is violence in the valley and we are prepared to fight. The Africans, we will do it since the British government has refused to use violence. And the main reason why the African people, especially the youth, can now resort to violence, because they are not allowed a word, not a word in politics. If I say anything against the government, I'll be behind the bars the next day. There are informers in every square mile of the country. Do you not fear an informer in this group now? I, they may be, I don't care. At this moment, I don't care if there is an informer. Maybe tomorrow I will be there behind the bars, and I don't mind. I am prepared to make such sacrifices, and even greater sacrifices for the freedom of the country. These boys talked to me in May at St. Ignatius College, just outside Salisbury. Four of them are now behind bars. Last month, the school was raided twice. The police came with guns, dogs, and tear gas. 23 arrests were made. The police were stoned, a Land Rover was turned over. Today, 18 days after their arrest, no charges have been made against the four boys still in custody. Now we're going to divide a minus three into two a to the power four minus five a cubed minus 10 a plus three. Would you do it for me please, one please? St. Ignatius College is a secondary school founded by the Jesuits nine years ago. These boys are aged between 15 and 19. They're among the elite of Rhodesia's young Africans, for only 180 black children reach the sixth form in any year, one in every 600. Or you could say three and five. The scarcity of secondary education, the lack of political opportunity, the difficulty they'll face in getting a job, all these lie at the root of the young Africans' frustration. The school's principal, Father Davis. The difficulty is the kind of law that we're getting now, like the Land Tenure Act and the Housing Act, and which is leading in only one direction, to my mind. And what is that direction? Well, it's leading to a sort of segregation of two races instead of making one country. Apartheid in the South African mould? I'm not quite sure whether I would say, go as far as to say that. I'm not sure, quite sure whether I would understand, because I don't know anything much about South Africa, strangely enough. But certainly, uh, two distinct races. That's what it seems to be aiming at and going towards. And how do you feel about that? Oh, I think it's a bad thing. This is one country. It should be a great country. And um, um, merit should be the reason why people go ahead and so on. Merit only. How do you feel when you see a 16-year-old African, uh, well-educated, bright, leaving school and unable to get a job? Is fed up all right to say on a television interview? Yes, very much so. If a black child and a white child emerged from school with similar qualifications, which would find it the most easy to get a job? Uh, certainly the white men. And to prove that, um, <coughs> a few gentlemen, some gentlemen from Salisbury, we are obviously supporters of the Smith government came here and we asked them the same question. Why that uh, uh, white men find it easier to find jobs? And obviously they said 
Just imagine if you're their brother and you were the manager of some company. If your brother and somebody else came, which one would you pick? And obviously the, the answer was my brother. Um, things are quite bad at the country at the moment, but uh, I think there's a growing tendency among the white children of our age to realize the hardships the African is facing. And I think this is um, also the case in South Africa. You've only got to consider what's been happening at the South African universities and to realize that the, um, the younger generation at any rate is realizing what the African has to put up to. And even though they, haven't, they can't do much about it, they're trying their hardest. Well, I'm speaking from experience because um, I've had the opportunity to learn with white boys. And admittedly, they tended to come from the upper class, but I think they're fairly representative of the young white children in the country. It's only the parents. And this gap between parents and children is widening. But uh, the young white kids are you know, making, um, are trying their hardest anyway to try and um, lessen the gap. Do you see hope in this situation? Yes, I think it's a hopeful sign. I mean, in terms of years, I don't think we can say that um, conditions will change in five years, but I think gradually um, the voice of the present generation anyway will not be neglected. Is there ever going to be black majority rule in this country? Um, certainly there will be. If we Africans strive long enough, but the trouble is we can't. We're ever suppressed. Each time we try to speak against the government, um, you might find that you're in trouble within a matter of seconds, which is rather too bad. I mean, they should accept opposition since they're in, in power. They should always accept uh, opposition from anybody. Do you think they're foolish not to? Yeah, that's true. That's true enough. Do you think then that if they do not accept some form of realistic opposition, hearing the realistically the African voice, there is bound to be a violent end to all this? There's bound to be chaos, that's all I can say. Especially if the African is going to be educated enough. In a way then, it's in the Europeans' best interest not to educate the African. That's, that's quite true. One thing that must be made clear to the British government is that the African people in this country are not at all worried about what political ideology they follow. If communism is going to bring them freedom, they will accept that ideology. And for that matter, I can assure you that Western democracy and civilization is really losing popularity in the country. This, of course, might be turned So by... if the British government and the British people still want some friendship <clears throat> with, the, with the African people in this country, they must see that they satisfy him by, give, by helping to give him freedom. They must force the Smith government. This, of course, might be said by Mr. Smith to be complete justification for keeping the African nationalists behind bars. What cause? What you've just said. And it is only, it is only the only way possible now for us to gain freedom because all the other ways have failed. Talks have failed. You can't reason with the Smith government. Is that they, what? they just don't accept to reason. They don't. So why are we going to waste our time talking with them? If they want to talk with us, they have people in the, in the parliament, the, the chiefs, whom they choose. Those people are uneducated, most of them. Why do they talk with them? Their, their speeches are made for them, and they speak what Smith wants. What does that help us? Yet there are many African graduates Many people who know politics, who are being left away from politics. Do the tribal chiefs speak for you? Well, it's very difficult for them to, because they are chosen by the government and they're supposed to support it. And moreover, they are paid by the government. If, if they say anything against it, they won't get anything. So obviously, they will be on the side of the government. And I must say, they are unpopular among the African. Um, Does anybody speak for you? Um, not really, no. The African's political representation is a curious mixture of ancient and modern. In Rhodesia's upper house, the Senate, sit the chiefs selected by a majority of the tribal elders. They're paid an allowance in order, as the government says, to enhance their prestige in the eyes of their people. 
In the lower house, 16 of the 66 MPs are elected by the black vote. Eight of them are chosen by these same tribal elders. The other eight are the only ones directly elected by the registered African vote, which, in a population of six million, numbers 8,326. This is a young country to which the white man came only 120 years ago. Today, the white man is outnumbered 20 to 1 by the black. But the political power is his, because the Rhodesian doctrine is that the reins of government must remain in what Mr. Smith describes as civilised hands. It's this insistence that makes a settlement impossible while the British government stands firm on the five principles. In the meantime, the young white Rhodesian is aware of his privileged position. The ease with which he'll get a job, for instance, compared with a black school leaver. What do you want to be? Myself? That's the million-dollar question. <laughs> um, at the moment, I'm working in a bank. Um, I suppose I want to do something in, um, in commerce or industry on the managerial side. Did you find it difficult to get a job? Oh, no. No, you can... I've had six jobs in no time. <laughs> no, not difficult at all. What do you think about the situation where the African school leaver, in many cases the African graduate, mm -hmm. finds it difficult to get a job? Yes, I think this is true. I think there should be a lot more done for the African from the point of view of jobs, providing for jobs, because there's a lot more of them than Europeans. And comparatively, there aren't as many jobs being provided for them. This is something which I suppose will take time. You know, you can't do this overnight. But nonetheless, it's something that should be worked on, you know? Well, I'm afraid this is one of our biggest problems because there are so many millions of Africans going through school. And the problem arises um, where you get an ever educated African coming out of, um, say, high school with good O-levels, and there are no jobs for him. And there's so many of them that, you know, right now there's not much we can do about it. And yet, you see, you, you talk to, to many adults and they would deny yes. that this is the situation. Well, this is only my personal opinion. But I've seen, you know, garden boys with O-level, this sort of thing. It's really sad. What do you think's happening to this country today? Um, it's fluctuating terribly, I think. The, <clears throat> I think it's tending to be a, a slight repression, very slight. And the hope is that this tendency just doesn't increase. But uh, oh, there are others who think exactly the opposite, of course. But... Uh, if you ask me where I'm going to use my vote, this is the way I put it, to stop this. And I certainly agree with uh, my friend up there that this business of, of having equal rights for equal qualifications is certainly something we must try and get. Quite often at school we have discussion groups about this subject. I think, like he says, it helps us, makes us more broad-minded. Are you critical of the government? Sometimes, if, if, if we have to be. But broadly speaking, do you think that the government represents the uh, points of view of most of you and your friends? I think so, yes. The friend beside you is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, generally, that the country's doing well. If, if an African government had to take over, it would just go rock bottom, hit the bottom. I think it would. Zambia has um, dropped down, because after all, there was a European government there. And suddenly when the Africans came and they tried to kick out all the Europeans, and now look at the country now, it's, I mean, it's, sanctions are backfiring onto them. So I think, you know, Rhodesia is going very well at the moment. I think sanctions have done us, you know, quite a lot of good. Um, much to the chagrin of uh, the British um, government. And, you know, I, wouldn't, I would certainly not uh, give any quarter, you know, uh, concerning m um, majority rule. You don't think there should be majority rule? Well, I think at the moment, no. Is there anything that you would try to explain to a British politician about your country which you don't think he understands? Yes, certainly. Um, I think the relationship between the black-white, you know, it's, they, they see overseas as, as, as the cruel tormentors of the, the poor African, you know, whereas uh, this is not the case at all. I th we get along very well with the Africans, you know. We both try to help each other, you know, and we mutually understand one another. They're just two totally different ways of life. And this cannot be bridged, you know, in a few generations. But there are obviously, as you yourself have said, uh, inequalities of yes, opportunity. Yes, there definitely are inequalities of opportunity, and I think this should be rectified if possible. And what about the policy of separate development, which is the declared policy of the um, Well, the policy of separate development takes in, um, you know, the fact that there are differences among uh, the black and blacks and whites. I mean, the blacks themselves support separate development. I think uh, there should be separate development, but there ought to be, at the same time, opportunities for Africans to make their way, you know, and to do well.
Certainly, the pattern of life of many Africans in Rhodesia has changed little over the centuries. Perhaps three million blacks live in the tribal trust lands, areas traditionally theirs. For many Africans to talk of a concept of Western democracy is meaningless. Far more important is the day-to-day -day struggle for an adequate living. On a practical level, the government are spending thousands of pounds on teaching them modern farming methods. Their Africans, they say, are better off, more literate than in any other part of the continent, except South Africa. The ingredients are one part soya bean meal to one part maize meal. And if in this government-sponsored cooking class the terminology is Western, with talk of spoonsful, pounds and ounces, it only underlines the final irony of the situation. Because the more the African becomes educated to Western ways and values, the more he will covet the standard of living and the political freedom that his European neighbour enjoys. The most crucial statistic in Rhodesia today is that the black population will double in the next 18 years. A few black Africans have fine homes like these on the outskirts of Salisbury. As the population grows, so too will the ambitions of the black majority. Sir Robert Treadgold was Chief Justice of Rhodesia until he resigned in 1960. His family came here around 1890 as part of the pioneer column that set out to claim the heart of Africa for Britain. Today, an outspoken critic of the Smith government, Sir Robert lives near the place where he was born in 1899. How would you describe the situation in this country today? We have here uh, a ratio of more than 20 Africans to one white person. And it's quite absurd that that small section at the top are going to uh, continue indefinitely uh, to supply all the advanced skills in the country. And uh, there's going to be great African advancement. You can see it now, even uh, Although they, they, it's not encouraged, and uh, at least not in, in the white areas, but it's coming from sheer force of circumstances, just as it's coming in South Africa. Do you see any differences between the situation in Rhodesia today and the situation in South Africa? Uh, oh, yes, there, there is quite a difference. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it depends whether you look at it from a legal point of view or from the point of view of attitudes. The, uh, th this country has never had the, the uh, stark prejudice that stands in, in South Africa, and I don't think that that's true of it today. But uh, from a legal point of view, there's not a great deal of difference, I don't think, no. What do you mean? Well, I mean, the, the, this, the repressive legislation that's been passed almost parallels the apartheid in South Africa now. Uh, certainly it opens the door to it. The, I don't think that any further legislation would be required. Complete apartheid could be brought in under the existing laws. The legislation aimed at keeping the races apart is now being felt in the schools. Athletics, like most adult sport in Rhodesia, is multiracial. Rhodesia's Athlete of the Year last year was a black sprinter. But in government-run state schools, all team games are segregated, which sets a problem for the many independent private schools. What do you feel about this situation where uh, <coughs> private schools have to uh, take Africans out of their team if they're playing against a government school? I think that depends on the school. We just don't play as school if we cannot play on their field. They come to us or they refuse to play with us. We refuse to play with them if they say we have to take any of our coloreds, Chinese or African art. So if there's any segregation, in fact, you refuse to play them? Yes. Do you think there's freedom of speech in this country? No, definitely not. I think the minute you say something, it goes back and goes back. I know my parents are terrified something's going to happen when I start talking, because they're sort of <laughs> servants and <laughs> I usually put my foot in it. Have you had any evidence of anything which you've said uh, going back, as you put it? Yes, well, it's been thrown in my parents' face, and they've told, told me to be quiet. Um, I think it's mainly when I start criticising the apartheid principles that occur. Black African friends, we've got a few in our class, but it's very difficult to communicate with them. They seem to close up any time you, you try to talk to them, and we do go out of our way to make them feel at home. But I think so many of them have been rebuffed 
by other whites that they feel that they can't speak to anybody else. They don't seem to realize that not everybody's the same. And we've all got different opinions. If you had a, a black African friend, would you take him home? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind it. No. I mean, no, I think this is very frowned upon. Um, I had a friend who, um, who felt very sort of friendly with Africans. And he once came into our home and he sort of shook hands with my, my houseboy, you know, sort of speaking to him. And my mother sort of said, look, what's he trying to do, you know? Why is he trying to go to extremes about things? I think it is fairly well found upon. But I must say that I do know one African who I probably respect more than any other person I know. Um, Why? Because he's an intelligent person and he, his mind is developed. When I speak to him, I speak to an intelligent person, not to an African. To an equal? To an equal, yes. But this is, um, f you know, few and far between. Can I ask you how you think your parents have handled the building of this country? I mean, are you critical at all of what your parents, the people uh, in power, have done, let's say, during the last 20 years? No, I think they've done a very good job when you consider the age of the country compared with, um, say, the United States which has racial problems far worse than ours. Can I ask whether you believe in equal rights? Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, if everyone's equally educated. Yes, I do. Yes, I think I do. Yes. Do you believe in one man, one vote? Uh, yes, if the people are educated at the same level. At the moment, I don't, because you find that as far as education is concerned, the whites are in the majority and one can't give the vote to uneducated people that they can't use their judgment, they can't assess the situation correctly. But how can you say that when you also believe in equal rights? I do believe in equal rights, but do you think rights are equal if you've spent 12 years at school being taught cultural things, science, the arts, and someone comes straight out of a hut in the bush? Do you think he deserves the same rights as you, if he had been educated on the same standard, fair enough. But then but he should have equal the, educational rights as well, shouldn't yes. he, to enable him to come out of that yes, hut but, in the bush mm, uh, with but, a parallel education to yours. Mm, let me say, the Europeans have brought this country to what stage it is at the moment, so surely the Europeans should be educated, since they are the ones that have come and brought the education, since it's their educational system. The African is at the same, some of them are at the same stage now that they might have been several hundred years ago. The black population in Rhodesia is growing faster than almost anywhere else in the world. Are you worried yourself by the fact that in the next 18 years or so the African population is going to double? Well, it's something to think about. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm worried about it. You know, people also say there's going, might be a nuclear war, be wiped out, but I don't worry about it. It's just something which, well, which you, um, which you think about from time to time. Tonight, four black schoolboys are spending their 19th night in prison without a charge. In case Mr. Heath and company may feel this bunch is just a, a horde of extremists, I'll give him a practical example. There is a certain degree of tolerance in a chained, tame animal. You may pester it for the first time, and you can do that for as many times as you like. But a time will come when that big chain will snap and the big animal will remove its tail from its hind legs. Then it will start, I mean, barking. Then from barking, it will bite. According to Prime Minister Ian Smith, in his lifetime, there will never be majority rule. He could be wrong.